Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. On today's video, we're gonna be taking a look at this machine. It's a Commodore 128D, D for desktop and D for abandoned. I guess that be C128A. Well, anyways, yes, this machine was found by a friend of mine and it was kind of in terrible shape. And I have no idea if this thing works at all. As per usual with my channel, the computer was given to me completely untested. And other than me trying to clean it up a little bit, I don't know anything about it. So in this video, let's see if this thing is actually working. And if it's not, I'll try to repair it as normal. So without further ado, let's get right to it. So the 128D, or I think known as the DCR, or cost reduced, so D for desktop, and then the CR is the later version, like the ones sold in North America, which have a metal case, which interestingly enough is the cost reduced version. The original 128D was actually the same motherboard that was in the regular flat 128, and then they built this rather complicated and I guess expensive plastic case around it. it even had a place for the keyboard to go underneath, kind of like the Amiga 1000. And on that original one, since it was the standard motherboard, the floppy drive that was integrated into the unit actually had a separate circuit board, which was the same one, as far as I'm aware, that was inside the actual 1571 external disk drives. This cost-reduced version actually has the disk drive, uh, controller, the CPU, and all that stuff integrated onto the motherboard, and the whole motherboard design is different than the original 128 flat. The original 128D was never sold in North America, only this cost-reduced version. Now, one of the things about these 128Ds is that they do appear from time to time, kind of like this one did, but having an external keyboard is actually something that is a bit of a rarity. Now, I actually had someone donate a 128D to me previously, and there's been a video, I think, on the main channel uh, maybe a couple years ago now with that machine, and this is the keyboard from that machine. So I broke this out so in case this thing does work, we can actually do some testing. I'm pretty sure there's a way to make an adapter that goes from the normal 128 flat keyboard without the case, obviously. From a functionality perspective, the D variant is exactly the same as the regular flat variant. It's just in this metal case, so you can stack your monitor on it so it's a little bit more desktop friendly than the large flat 128. Now, when I first got this machine, it was absolutely filthy and I actually cleaned it up, even though it hardly looks like it. The drive lever here, for instance, is really dirty looking. And there was actually a lot of rust on the top metal cover when I got it. And I did the usual thing where I applied wheel cleaner to it, the de-rusting wheel cleaner. This is for cars, that is. And it kind of eats away at the rust and exposed this clear metal. And then I use some nail polish to actually cover that up, which doesn't look super great, but to be honest, it's better than the huge rust spots that were all over this. And if you're gonna be stacking your monitor on top of the computer, then you won't even really notice that anyways. Looking at the side of the computer, I think I neglected to clean it because it's, <laughs> it's really, really dirty. There's a port here on the side for the cassette drive. There's the keyboard connector, the two joystick ports, and we have a reset switch. Back of the machine has the cartridge port. We have the video and the IEC ports, an RF output. This is for digital TTL, RGB, and also 80 column composite video output from this nine pin. And then we have a user port. And all these ports are basically identical to what's on a regular C128, which are mostly the same as the C64, except for the digital RGB port, which doesn't exist on the 64. And of course that external keyboard connector. Well, since this computer is in such poor shape on the outside, we really need to take a look on the inside before I even attempt to plug this in and power it up. I have not done that, even though I've cleaned it up on the outside and did a little bit of treatment off for the rust there. So opening this thing, I really have no idea if this thing's gonna work, if it's missing parts inside, like what the deal is. So let's get this cover off. Uh, oh, uh, is there screws on the side? I can never remember how this opens. There's actually a warranty seal right here and it is not ripped. So that is now going to be voided. All the stuff this computer's been through that got it all rusty and dirty on the outside, and uh, no one has ever opened it up before. It's been a while since I've opened up one of these, but I think I also need to remove this screw and looks like there's one on the other side. And the front bezel is 
popping off right here. So I suppose this thing was dropped or something. Okay, does the top come off now? Yes, it's starting to slide. Oh, there it goes. I wonder if I should be wearing gloves. All right, so in the top cover, at least this thing's not all rusted. It's sort of what galvanized or zinc coated or something like that. So that's good, sort of an anti-corrosive coating. And the inside of this machine is actually a lot better looking than I guess I thought it was gonna be. I just assumed from the horribleness on the outside that things would look pretty rough in here. So right off the bat, I'm not noticing anything out of the ordinary. The fact that that uh, warranty sticker was still on the back of the case gives us an idea that no one's been in here mucking around. What's kind of amusing about this 128 is the marketing literature for this could have called it a triple processor computer because of course it has a 6510, which is just a 6502 for the Commodore 128 slash C64 side of things. It also has the Z80 processor in here, which is used for running CPM. And it has a 6502, which is used specifically for the disk drive operation. So it wouldn't even be lying. This thing really is a triple processor computer. Fancy. So I think the first thing we need to look at is the mains power supply here. Now I have to give the standard warnings, caution high voltage, don't work on this if you don't know how to be safe. Plugging in the mains into this thing suddenly gives you 120 volts here in North America, well, plus it turns into rectified DC, so it's even more like 165 volts or whatever it is. So don't work on this power supply or any power supply for that matter, unless you know how to be safe. Now this power supply connects to the main board through this connector right here, which I've just disconnected. I'm assuming we have 12 volts, five volts, ground, and then we have two extra wires here, which might be for AC or something. I'm not totally sure, actually. Also coming off the power supply is this wire right here, which just goes to the power LED on the front of the case. And what is interesting as well is there's like a provision here for a fan, but this one doesn't have the fan and you saw this thing was never open. The seal was not broken. And my other 128 DCR also has no fan. So I guess Commodore thought, eh, it's not really needed. So we'll keep this a nice silent machine. Let's do some rudimentary power supply testing. I have the red wire and the black wire connected to these nails here, which are connected to both the multimeter and this light bulb here from a car. That's gonna create some load on this power supply, so it's not just gonna run unloaded, and we'll be able to see what the five volt rail is on the multimeter. And everything looks good here. There's no short circuits. Turn that on. There we go. We have five volts, well, 5.11 volts. It looks good. This is a pretty difficult load actually, because as soon as you turn on a light bulb like this, it actually creates like a dead short briefly, um, but the power supply is able to start up without too much trouble. I wanna see what the 12 volt rail is. So I have the nail stuck in on the other end here, I have the multimeter connected. Let's turn this on. There we go, 12.45 volts. So that looks good as well. So that little bit of testing there just gave me a little bit of assurance that this power supply is not outputting some kind of a voltage that seems too high or outrageous because especially the five volt rail that comes out of this and goes into the motherboard is all that protects all these ICs from being over voltaged. This is only the second C128 DCR I've ever worked on. So I don't have a lot of experience if these power supplies are reliable or not, but the construction looks simple enough. These are the output filter caps. You wanna check for any kind of leakage of the electrolyte to come out of those. We have an adjustment here, which will almost certainly be for adjusting the five volt output of this. And the 12 volt is derived from the five volt. So raising the five volts or lowering it down will have an effect on the 12 volts. It wouldn't be unusual for these two caps to possibly be refas, and that's because this is used for interference suppression of the switch mode power supply back into the AC line. Just in this case, they use these types of caps here. I think it's but polyester, and these don't seem to have any kind of issues, although they can become leaky over time. And if one of these is attached between the live and the earth ground, this green wire right here, what can happen is it couldn't cause your breakers to trip. And indeed, the schematics here on Zimmers for the North America power supply shows that C1 is one we need to worry about. This has full line voltage across it. If this were a reefer cap installed on this power supply, this would be one we definitely would want to swap out. This would let the magic smoke out if it became leaky. And then also this one here, C3, which does go between the live and the earth ground, which is right here. And that one should be a Y safety cap or a Y2 safety cap. C24 also sees the full line voltage, so that one would need to be checked and replaced if it was also leaky. Looking at a photograph of the power supply in this machine, unfortunately, the various markings for these components don't match. So there must have been an alternate supplier or multiple suppliers of the power supply. So the only way to know for sure which of these caps might be connected between the earth ground and the live or the live and the neutral will be to take this power supply board out and look at the underside. 
Okay, so we saw the voltages look good. Power supply is reconnected to the motherboard. I could plug this back in, and now we gotta get a video cable connected because we gotta see if this thing is working. It's been what feels like forever since I've done any repair work on an 8-bit Commodore machine. We don't even know if this thing is gonna need repair or not, but the retro tank is hooked up. Let's see if this thing is working. That is normal. And it's trying to auto boot. I can't believe this thing just works. It's just, it just works. So yeah, left for dead, like in a garage or wherever it was, it got water leaked all over the top of it at least. And it freaking works. Well, in this bag, I have the diagnostic test harness and I have never shown this on a video before because this is only really the second 128D that I've ever worked on, but I actually have a 128D keyboard loopback connector now so I can fully test this thing out. Now, one thing I wanna do before I connect this thing up is I noticed if we turn this up a little bit, the cassette port, which is right here, is really, really dusty. So before I plug my harness in, I wanna grab one of these cotton swabs here and I have this little dispenser thing for alcohol that Andrew gave me and you just push that and bubbles up a little bit and I'm gonna clean up the contacts here a little bit. But that's some of the dirt that was on that cassette port connector. And I'm gonna do the same stuff on the back here, like for the user port, which is hidden away under the power supply, but I'm sure, oh yeah, that's dirty as well, really dirty. And for the cartridge port, I'm just gonna spray some contact cleaner on the back side here, and then some inside the connector this way as well. Um, this is the QD electric cleaner. So it's not deoxid, but it just kind of helps flush away some of that dirt and stuff. All right, so dead test and diagnostic. Well, we didn't need the dead test because the thing just freaking worked. So plug in the regular diagnostic. And now time to connect up the harness. So when I made this thing, I added really long cables. This particular computer, I knew that if I'd ever test one of these again, you have pretty long runs. So there's the user port connected. And then the cassette port has to cross all the way over here to the front. And you know what? It doesn't work because these ears stick out too much and it doesn't fit into the hole. Well, I haven't run into that problem before. I'm gonna grab the Dremel and I'm gonna cut those ears off. They're not needed for anything. All right, a little jump cut later, it's all trimmed up. There's a little bit of plastic dust on there, but it shouldn't have any negative effect. With the cable reconnected, this should now plug in, yep. We have the joystick ports that need to connect up. So one is there and this one goes there. And then for the keyboard connector, and this is of course the one that goes on the regular 64 here. So we can unplug that and then we can connect this up to this part here. Now that actually has an IC on it and the one on the 64 doesn't. Don't know if that's totally necessary and there's a button here as well, but we'll find out. And then the last thing we need to connect up is the IEC loopback. Now I should probably go read a manual somewhere to see uh, if there's anything I need to do for this internal disk drive running this diagnostic ROM. And the reason why I say that is because um, it's hard to grab this thing. The disk drive here is connected to the IEC port, it's device eight, and it is connected right now. Even though I have that loopback connector here, this disk drive is still in play. Normally you'd unplug everything in the back of your 64, your 128, and you hook up the loopback. What's gonna happen here? I don't know but we are ready to turn this thing on and see if the diagnostic ROM does anything. The 64 diagnostic will not test all the RAM. It won't test the other half of the RAM. It only tests the first 64K, but it should be able to test all the ports and stuff, the user port and joystick ports and whatever else. And let's see what happens here. I don't think I have the speakers connected right now, so we won't necessarily hear if the uh, SID test is working. Okay, we got a whole lot of bads here. So cassette, keyboard, control, serial, we're kind of getting everything is bad. That kind of screams that we're getting a bad connection on things. And I kind of believe that's the case, because look at this. I just sort of touch this and the light comes off and on. So I'm gonna cut the power here. And I think deoxid on everything is what's called for. So I have my little dropper bottle of deoxid. I'm just gonna put this right kind of onto everything actually in the keyboard port in the joystick ports. And we'll just sort of rock these back and forth a little bit. And it goes without saying, we're gonna have to do the same thing on the back here. We know the cartridge port is working, but that's the only one I actually sprayed the contact cleaner directly into. But now we have deoxid on everything. Just gonna plug in the speakers while we're waiting here as well, so we can hear some audio. Now nah, everything is still showing bad, and I don't believe it. I think there's just something going on with the harness. It's just, 
not making good contact on this particular computer. So I think what I'm going to do is remove this power supply entirely from this and also take the disk drive out. And that way I can, I can look at those connectors because they're hidden underneath and I can see why they're not making good contact. If it's not making good contact on the user port, then none of this other stuff is gonna work at all. It's gonna say everything is bad. It's basically the same as running this without the test harness. Okay, for the power supply removal, I feel a screw there, there's one there, and there are some screws back here. So I think I take those out and that power supply should just lift out. Okay, there we go. Yeah, that's looking in pretty rough shape. I have this uh, pencil eraser thing here from Germany, which if I reposition the computer properly, I can probably polish these up a little bit. Yep, that works a treat. You're probably not gonna really be able to see what I'm doing, but it's essentially like a little pencil eraser inside a pencil, so you can sharpen it to expose more. That's excellent for cleaning these gold contacts. It's getting all that crud right off. Wow, this is, this works really well. Hopefully you can see the tip there, it's getting all filthy. And then you can use the brush end here, clean it up a little bit. What I like to do then, I'll use a little magic eraser and just some of this uh, QD electric cleaner here to give it a final wipe. That kind of really cleans off a lot of the junk. For the cassette port, which you can't really see, I'm gonna to have to take the disk drive out. We have three screws for the floppy drive and we have to get this lever off here. So I'll just use a plastic spudger tool to slide the dirty thing off. Ugh, I gotta admit it's kind of gross and it's very stuck. All right, well, that wasn't supposed to happen. It's supposed to slide off the shaft, but instead it took the whole shaft out of the disk drive. This happens on these 1541s when they get old and the whole thing just sort of falls apart here, unfortunately. So yeah, that's not supposed to happen. Now for these connectors here, I always put a, a mark on them just to make it obvious which way they connect back on. The three connectors are different number of pins, but you could plug them in backwards and that you don't want to do. All right, so with the cables unplugged and that lever out, this should come out now. Unfortunately, the whole mechanism's falling apart now because this stuff here is not supposed to be like this because that shaft was supposed to stay in the disk drive. My assumption is over time, like the plastic shrinks or something and just like gets jammed in there. But at least now we can properly clean the cassette connector here. All right, well, that is looking super shiny and very nice now. Let's see what happens here. Now, there could still just be a fault. The whole time, this could have been a fault. Maybe one of the 6526s, the one that drives the user port is bad. Okay, keyboard open. Let's power that off. I forgot to plug the keyboard in. All right, let's try that again with the keyboard loop back connected, but we saw a lot of bads on there already. So I have a feeling that we do have a fault in this machine. Now I'm gonna complain a little bit here about this diagnostic ROM. It's meant to be a quick test, right? So this is for people who are like working in a repair shop and you know turning through 64 and having to repair them. So it doesn't give you a lot of good detail. Like when it says there's something wrong with the cassette port or the keyboard port, what's wrong exactly? And it doesn't tell us that. Now, what it is telling us here is that U1 and U2 are both bad. Those are the 6526s, which I think on this are the whatever the 8500 version of it is, like from the, the later 64s. Now, personally, I have a really hard time believing that those chips are both completely bad. Now, they could well be, and maybe that's why this machine was put out to pasture, you know, stop being used. I think one good test is I'm just gonna plug the keyboard in and boot to basic and let's just see if I can type anything. Okay, I have the keyboard connected up. I unplugged everything else, oh, except for the loopback connector. We can just unplug that. Hmm, what's it doing here? Oh, you know what? The keyboard has a 40, 80 column button and this is a good trap for people who aren't familiar with this machine. If you push that, I bet you right now it's displaying 80 columns. So I push that button and there we go. So it's able to sense that, which kind of implies that the 6526 for the keyboard is somewhat working. In fact, the other trick is hold down Commodore because I think it's trying to boot the floppy drive and it's not even in there right now. So it's just sitting here. I'm gonna hold Commodore and 
it should go into the 64 mode. There it is. So now this is a test. I mean, it freaking works. There is nothing wrong with the 6526s. I'm just gonna type all the keys here in 64 mode. Everything is working perfectly. So there is no fault with the 6526, at least the one that controls the keyboard. And the diagnostic ROM very clearly said that both of 6526s were bad. But I think this is where like it's giving us false information. Now we have a couple possibilities here. We could have a bad contact on the user port still. We could also have it where this diagnostic harness is just not compatible with the 128D CR for whatever reason, like maybe there's something electrically slightly different on this machine. Or the final thing is the 6526 or whatever the 85 chip is on this thing that controls the user port might be faulty. And the diagnostic ROM relies on the user port to function properly. And of course it'd have a good connection to the test harness here, oh, which is still connected in order for it to sense if the other ports are working properly. Well, let's do some testing of our own. So I just put in the Easy Flash 3 cartridge and we're gonna power this thing back up again. And I'm gonna grab my joy pad here and we'll run a joystick test. Up, down, left, right, fire. Okay, that one works. Port one is fine. Port two, up, down, left, right, fire. It works as well. And both of those were reported as bad by diagnostic ROM, erroneously, obviously. While we're here, I'm gonna load the SID tester. This is a basic program that just does a good job testing everything. I won't subject you to the sound it makes. I'm gonna listen for myself just to know if this SID is working properly. And yep, everything on that SID is working perfectly. No issues at all. All right, so joystick ports are working. Keyboard port is working. I think the next thing to do is I need to put that floppy drive back in this unit and let's see if the disk drive is working properly. Before I put this disk drive back in, I need to reassemble this whole lever assembly here. So while we're here, let's just clean this extremely nasty lever here. It's funny how this side here is not yellowed at all and it's all on that side. Ugh. I noticed while working on this computer that there's definitely an odor of cigarettes as well. So this was potentially grime from a cigarette smoker. I think how this works is this little thing here is what actually pushes that down. So that goes like that. And then this little black thing is just a bushing, which is almost like a spacer. So you just have to slide it over that part there. And then now you have to be careful not to put this in the wrong way where this is like sticking up the wrong way because this is a friction fit in there. So you turn that to the position where the drive is open. And now we've got to push this all back into here. Oh, there we go. And it goes through and you push it down enough so it does slot into there like that. And now that's working. Now what I need to do is try to pull this lever off again, but by keeping the shaft in place. Okay, there we go, like that. I wanna make sure that this all stays together here. Now, while this is apart, I also wanna see if those heads look okay, because everything else was super grimy. So I'm gonna to try to clean inside there. So again, I'm gonna use this little IPA dispenser with uh, one of these flat things here. So we'll just pop a little IPA on there and oh, I can't really lift the heads up because this uh, plate is in the way. So I just have to very carefully get in there. I'll use a cleaning disc as well, but in case there's like a whole bunch of grime on there, which there really wasn't, look at that, came out clean. You just wanna make sure there's not a big clumps of dust and stuff on there. Now let's see how this thing moves. It doesn't move great. So I have some bearing oil here. I'm gonna put some drops of this on here. Let me figure out the best place to do that. Down here on this uh, shaft, there and there. And we'll move this back and forth. Oh yeah, it's starting to free up quite a bit. You might wanna use a cotton bud if you put too much oil. So I'm just gonna to try to sop up the extra. Okay, let's reinstall this back into the computer. Glad I made those marks because I already know which way these go back on. Usually the there's sort of memory to the wires, so they kind of fall back into the right position. But I really do recommend putting those uh, marks on there first, just to make sure. There is a bunch of grime on the front here too. So now the lever's off. I'm just gonna try to clean that up a little bit. Oh, so gross, so dirty. 
I'm going to use my Adrian's tools. I have a 1541 exerciser tool here. It's this diagnostic cartridge, which I got from World of Janney. And while this is a 1571, so it won't test like both sides of the heads and everything like that, it's still very useful just for running through all the exercises of a 1541 at least. It formats the disc, does all this diagnostics. If you find yourself working on lots of floppy drives on Commodores and you have a way to make cartridges, I really recommend this cartridge. It just seems to be really good at detecting issues with the disk drives. All right, so I have my cleaning floppy here. I'm just gonna stick this in the disk drive. And this is a double-sided drive, so I'm using a double-sided cleaning floppy. I'm just gonna use H for head exerciser and let's just turn motor off on. Let's see, F5. So I'm just moving the head around using the F keys on the keyboard here and it's working. And hopefully that got off any of the last grime that might've been on those heads. I'm gonna put in a scratch disc, one that is okay to erase. And we're gonna use P for performance test. And for performance, it's talking about putting the disk drive through its paces, the whole gamut formatting the disk drive and reading, writing, and doing all that kind of stuff. So it's a very comprehensive test. All right, just like that, the disk drive test totally passed. So this drive appears to be working perfectly. All right, what's on this disk is a copy of CPM for the C128, but it's a modified version that runs much faster. For whatever reason, the one that Commodore made back in the day was slow and junky. So of course the community has patched that old version and it runs so much faster. It doesn't just load faster. The entire OS runs so much faster. Now, because we need to run in C128 mode, I'm gonna have to turn the computer off and pull this cartridge out here. And then we'll turn this back on and we should be booting. I think it should auto boot to CPM actually. Yep, there it goes, booting. Ah, right, okay. So look, it's running in 40 column mode. It does of course support 80 column mode if I push that 40, 80 column button on the keyboard, but it should be booting up here in 40 column mode, which CPM in 40 columns isn't exactly the best. But one thing is good is that this is booting the OS without any issue. And this disc is double-sided. So this is a double-sided disc drive when you're running in 1571 mode, which is what we're running in here. And it also runs in a burst mode, so it's much faster. And if we type DIR, we should get the directory on here of what's on this disc. And it is working now. Even though this is the faster CPM, take a look how slow the text update speed is. Imagine that this is the fast version. It is so much slower if you, don't, if you use the original version. It is staggering how slow CPM was on this machine. Considering that this computer was designed from the start to run and support CPM, which is why that Z80 processor is in there. The fact that it's so slow is kind of pathetic. I was looking around in my box of Commodore stuff and I found this, which seems to have several different diagnostics, including a C128 version. Let's see if that works and we can actually test the 128K of RAM. I mean, we know it's working. CPM booted up, which I think uses it all, but let's just see if this does the trick. And this is in slot three and we see we have address lines here. I think it's this one. Uh, no, that's not right. It's this one and this one on. And I can't remember if it should be set to game or XROM. So let's just see what happens with this installed in the back like that. That's clearly not the diagnostic row. <laughs> we got a pitfall. <laughs> All right. All right, I flipped one dip switch and now we're getting C64 diagnostics. So I'm just gonna keep changing this until I get what I expect. So there's the diagnostics for the disk drive. And that's nothing. That's another C64 diagnostic. Looks like I have a copy of Pac-Man on here. Another copy of Pitfall. And another copy of Pitfall. Only thing I'm thinking is that this one here that shows up as nothing, maybe this requires me to fiddle one of these other switches here. Like I'm gonna switch the game signal. That just sort of gives us blue screen of nothingness. How about the XROM signal? Black screen. <laughs> Okay, oh, there it is. So the right combination of switches got us to the C128 slash diagnostic test. Cool. Maybe this would have been the way to go forward with this testing all along. <laughs> Kernel ROM bad, basic high low ROM. I mean, maybe there's a different version on here. Obviously it's working. So that looks like it actually supports the test harness. So let's hook up this harness again and see if it works with this ROM. 
All right, the harness is reconnected. I'm not holding out hope that this is actually gonna work any better, but I suppose you never know. And there's probably people who are like screaming at their screens or going to the comment section right now telling me that, yes, you need to do the X, Y, and Z. And I'm sure if I just went to the documentation on Sven Peterson's GitHub repo for the harness, which is where this comes from, well, viewer Mike sent it in, but Sven designed this thing. And I bet you he says exactly how to use it on the 128. So maybe I should just go do that if this is not working <laughs> instead of all of this uh, rigmarole that I've been doing trying to test this machine. <laughs> well, here's a section on Sven's GitHub repo for C128 Diagnostic. There's the keyboard adapter I'm using. And sure enough, a Diagnostic ROM version 75.260 is required. I recommend the VersaCart, which is actually what we're using right now. So let's see, does this actually work? And I could have saved myself. No, we're still getting all the same freaking errors. Exactly the same errors. Oh, it does say the interrupt is working though. And oddly enough, it shows the user port is working. Now it said control port, which is the joystick port, were bad on both ports. And the thing is, if you look at the bottom where it says 6581, that's the SID chip, it doesn't say bad there. That means that what it thought was bad was the digital inputs and not the analog, which is what the SID handles. The problem is we know the digital input is working perfectly because we already tested it with a real joystick and the keyboard is working and the keyboard and the digital inputs on the joystick are basically one and the same, they're shared. So something is still going on either with the harness or a bad contact or the user port could still be bad. And the screenshot here on Sven's website shows it, it does work on a 128. But again, I wonder if there's some kind of an issue with the DCR version of the 128 versus the regular flat version. Sven says explicitly that the DCR version just requires a longer cable, about a meter, but it does work with the diagnostic ROM 785260. But look, I'm only using 588121 and not 785260, which is what Sven says you need to use. So it's time for me to go make <laughs> a new ROM chip. Okay, here it is, 785260. Looks like it's on this Commodore software download site here. So let's dig into this VersaCart. Clearly, I never use this for multiple cartridges because I have other solutions. So I think the best thing to do is replace this EEPROM with the 128 Diags, and I'm just gonna leave that as the only thing that's on here. The flexibility of this cartridge to allow you to configure these switches here, allow it to work on the 128 as a 128 cartridge itself, not automatically forcing the 128 into 64 mode. So here's the GitHub repo, and it looks like there are several different versions now, and I probably made this cartridge a good number of years ago. In fact, yeah, look how it's a, a much stubbier design. Now, the GitHub repo talks about the fact you can use 8K EEPROMs all the way through 8x8K. So that's a 27C64 all the way through a 27C512, like I have on here now. If you're going to use the larger EEPROM and put multiple games where you can select them with the dip switches here, then you use a command line like shown here to combine those files together into one file, which you're going to flash or burn onto the EEPROM. Even though I put a zip socket on here when I built it, I don't think I'm gonna use that anymore. I think I'm just gonna use this chip here, which is a 2864, which is pin compatible with a 2764, just to have that single diagnostic ROM image on here. So we'll just pop this into the programmer. 2864B is already selected. I'll load up the bin image into the programmer and we'll just program this chip, which only takes just a couple seconds. I've had a few of these 2864 chips go bad. They're ones from AliExpress, so a dubious quality. I try to always throw them away once they go bad. So if this is not working when we put it in here, then I may need to go into my stash and grab another one. We'll insert the EEPROM into the ZIF socket, and I'm just gonna set all of these address lines to on, which hopefully will satisfy whatever this chip needs to output its image properly. And incidentally, taking a look at Sven's website here for the harness, it does talk about the fact that XROM and game need to be high or open for this cartridge to work on the 128 as a 128 cartridge, which is what this diagnostic ROM requires, which on um, this particular cartridge is which is one and two, and they're set to the off position, which I guess is the same as open. On would be closed. All right, the diagnostic cartridge is in the back of the machine. This is the moment of truth. Will the correct version of the diagnostic ROM actually give us the correct output we're looking for, or are we still gonna have some type of a fault with this machine? There we go, turn that on, and we're not getting anything. Well, I've been fiddling with the switches and the chip in the socket, and it actually did work one time. The, the ROM started, but now it does that. 
oh, okay, no, it's working. So the fact it's all blown out is a retro tank problem. So the new firmware on the retro tank did not fix it. So we are running the right version now, 75260. So that's excellent. Everything is connected again. Yeah, let's power this on. Now look how it says 128D diagnostic ROM. Did the older version say that? I don't remember. Okay, here we go. Keyboard bad, control port bad. 4066 U2 is bad. So things are looking <laughs> way better. I'm turning the sound test down. So the cassette port now tests good. The serial port tests good. The user port is testing good. Interrupt is good. And it's just telling us that the 6526 installed at U1 is bad. Now I am a little skeptical about that 4066 saying it's bad. And I say that very specifically because I think that has something to do with the joystick ports, which well, as we saw are working properly. Now, everything I'm doing in this video is a perfect example of not reading the effing manual. And I'm gonna do that right now for the C128 diagnostic ROM. This was the one that was bundled with the bin file. And let's just read what it says about connecting the harness because maybe I'm just doing something wrong when it comes to the actual connections here. So it looks like make sure the power is off, plug the diagnostic cartridge in, plug the cable harness assembly into the user port, plug in the six pin edge connector and cassette port, plug in the DIN connector into the serial port. That's the little loop back connector. Plug the two nine pin mini DIN connectors into the control ports. It makes no difference which connector goes to which port. Check to make sure all the connectors are inserted correctly and do not install the keyboard connector until the diagnostic tests are running. The keyboard connector PCB need not be installed to run the diagnostic. Make sure the 8040 key is in the proper position for the tests you wish to execute. The 40 key is in the up position, all diagnostic tests are executed or the 4080 key is in the down position, all RAM testing is bypassed giving you system ROM and IO testing only. Okay, well, let's give that a try. So I'm gonna push down the 4080 column switch. And let's power this on. Okay, it does skip all that stuff. So that means this testing will run much faster. Wait a second. Now everything is testing correct now. So let me unplug the keyboard. So this just should loop. And here it goes looping. So you notice it has keyboard open. I don't have the loop back connected. So let's plug the loop back in. And let's see what happens when it loops again, if keyboard shows open or is working. Keyboard and control port bad. So something is up with this particular loopback connector. Let me unplug this cable here. So I'm just gonna plug this in on its own. Let's see what happens. Nope, as soon as I plug that in, even without the cable, it gives us the bad signal there. But removing this, I think we're gonna get everything testing good except for the keyboard. Thing is, we don't really need to test the keyboard. I typed on it and it's working. Now control port says, okay, but it's red. That's because it failed on a previous loop. But we saw on that first pass, once we booted up when the RAM tests were all skipped, that everything tested good, including the 6526 at U1 that currently says bad. Oh, never mind. I just went back to the GitHub repo, which this is my fault again, because I didn't just keep reading. Look right here. The C128 DCR does not provide five volt to the keyboard D sub jack. The keyboard dongle does not work here. A solution needs to be developed. This video is definitely a fiasco. It feels like I'm doing everything wrong and it shows a little bit of my inexperience with this machine. <laughs> And if I spent more than a second skimming through web pages, maybe I would have read the, the relevant parts so I could have actually avoided so many of these pitfalls. I'm not trying to make excuses here. Now, part of it is, of course, when I'm making a video, it's hard to you know use your full brain to comprehend everything you're reading because I'm also thinking about cameras and audio and switching inputs and a bunch of other video production stuff, not the repair stuff. So unfortunately, it leads to issues like this. But I think even if you're just a normal person who's trying to do this type of diagnostic work for the first time, you might not have read all the way down on Sven's webpage here to see that this keyboard diagnostic here does not work on the DCR, or you might not realize that this is the DCR versus the regular 128D, because that's all it says on the front. So these types of issues can definitely throw you curveballs and give you a false sense of there's something wrong with this machine, when in reality, this computer is actually working perfectly. Both of these are labeled, so hopefully in the future when I test another DCR, whenever that might be, if ever, I'll hopefully not make the same mistakes I made in this video. So we have now determined that this computer is now fully functional. I'm not totally done with this video though. I wanna test one more thing. 
I mentioned earlier in the video that one of the problems with the 128D and the DCR is that the keyboard is often misplaced by the owners. So they find the computer in their garage or wherever and they go to sell it, but the keyboard is nowhere to be found. And a 128D without the keyboard is a little bit hard to use. So I wanted to see if I could use a 128 flat keyboard, which I have a terrible example here. This is actually my parts keyboard, but this comes right out of a flat machine. Can I get this working externally with the 128D? Inside the 128 keyboard case, it's just the same thing as this keyboard here. There's no electronics, there's nothing like that. It's the same exact signaling coming over the wire as it would connect to the motherboard. And what you may notice is the 25 pin male connector here used on the D keyboard. And the one that's on the flat keyboard is also 25 pin D sub pinout, but female. And people have mentioned using an extension cable or a gender changer to connect this connector straight up to the computer. Well, I don't think it's gonna be that simple, at least not without dremeling this connector here because it doesn't actually fit in there. So I can't just use a normal extension cable with a male connector to plug into this. Now the question is how to carefully remove enough material here so the pins don't come out, but then it fits inside of here. If I had a bench grinder, I could just carefully grind that away and you could do it while looking at it like, like this but I don't have a bench grinder, so I guess the Dremel's gonna have to do. And luckily I'm testing on this junk keyboard here, so it doesn't really matter if I damage this. Well, that was a lot easier than I thought. This little sanding thing allowed for perfect shaving of that into the right shape without taking off too much material. So now theoretically, I should be able to plug this into this extension cable. It's not really going in though. I wonder if the pins on this 25 pin are just a little bit too big to fit in there. I'll just grab this zip drive cable. Maybe this one will work a little bit better. So let's plug this end into the computer and see what happens. All right, here we go, moment of truth. I don't even know how well this keyboard works, if at all. All right, so it's definitely kind of working, but the matrix is a bit of a mess. The forum post that I saw said you need to use a straight through cable, and this is just a normal SCSI cable, so I'm assuming this is just a straight through cable. Well, the problem we're having here seems to be outlined in this forum post. So a straight through cable, which is pin one to pin one, which is just like the SCSI cable we're using here, it says that these cables are abundant, but they won't work. We need a proper straight through cable. I think that is actually incorrect, a straight through being pin one to pin one. And it does say you need to have pin one routed to pin 13, which is all the pins horizontally flipped or a mirror image. So not rotated 180 degrees, but just flipped on this axis. So I'm gonna go away and see if I can make an adapter using a couple DB25 connectors soldered together, and maybe we'll have a working flat keyboard in just a moment. And there's the adapter I made. I actually kind of messed up a little bit. I mean, this should work, but what I should have done is I should have made this one here a female connector, and that way I could have used a straight through cable like that SCSI cable to extend this, because right now, the way this is set up, I have to plug this into the side of the computer or I need to get a straight through cable that is male and female 25 pin, which I don't have one in stock. But the adapter was as simple as just taking two of these things and sticking them together and soldering all the pins together. It was actually quite easy to make. And plug this into the side of the computer, like so. And will this work? I don't really know how well this keyboard works, but it should work better than it was working. Hello. There's no space bar. Let me find a spare key that I can put in here because the space bar is working, but I need to put a spring on there to keep it from always making contact. There we go, an asterisk key is installed there that keeps it from pushing down. So yeah, this is, this is freaking working. Yes, this totally works. Well, that is pretty cool, I gotta say. It's not like 128 flat keyboards grow on trees and are super common either, but they're definitely a lot more common than the keyboards for these 128Ds. When I was looking around for how to connect this up, it seemed like there were other options out there like PS2 or USB adapters that take a regular PC style keyboard and then adapt it to the right pinout to go into the 128. And if it's for the regular 128, then we know it's gonna work on this anyways if you just build an adapter like this. So unless you have a spare 128 flat keyboard just sort of laying around, then using one of those new modern adapters is probably the right way to go. I'm pretty stoked though that it really it just took like 50 cents worth of parts to make this keyboard work on this computer. And this parts keyboard, which I always just have sort of kicking around the basement, will be perfect to leave this adapter on here in the future if I ever need to test any further 128Ds. The final thing we haven't seen working is the digital RGB output. So I have the RGB to HDMI connected. Let's power on the machine. 
there we go, it's working perfectly. There's already a profile in the RGB to HDMI for the Commodore 128, so you don't even have to worry about any of the setup stuff. Let's put in the CPM 3.0 disc that we looked at earlier, but now we're booted up into 80 columns mode because I have that button pushed down. So when I reboot the computer here with the reset button, we will get the proper CPM experience in full 80 columns. All right, let's take a look at this. Let's see if that scrolling speed is any worse. Yeah, what is this like? It's, it's equivalent to like a 2400 baud modem, the way that the text updates there. So let's run the help utility here. Yeah, I mean, it's like modem speed. And yet this is running locally on the computer. All right, I just plugged in the Kung Fu flash cartridge into the back of the machine because what we haven't done yet is actually have a proper 8-bit dance party. So let's power this on and it goes right into the 8-bit dance party and it is freaking working. Nice. Ah, it's been a long time since I've done one of these. Anyways, okay, enough of that. Yes, uh, the SID definitely works on this thing. I mean, this whole computer, the Commodore 64, really the bread bins have a reputation being kind of unreliable. But once you kind of get to like the mid to later 80s, Commodore started making some really reliable stuff. The Commodore Amiga is a good example of it. Amigas generally just work if it's not for battery leakage and things like that. And this 128 would have come out, you know, later in the 80s, and it just works as well. It was left for dead, and it still absolutely works. Now, what I don't know for sure is what kind of SID is in this machine. The SID is quite quiet, but I don't know if it's an 8580 or if it's a 6581. I know the older flat 128s are 6581s, but not sure about this machine. Let's see, so this is one of the tracks from Lunatico, side one, and definitely is designed for the 8580. It doesn't sound correct on the older SIDs. Yeah, so I think this machine has a 6581 because that song doesn't quite sound right, at least from my recollection of how it should sound. I think we've reached the end of this video. This C128 definitely works. And what I want to do is run this Christmas demo here because let's be honest, everyone who always had a 128 pretty much just always used it in 64 mode. It was just a more fancy 64 with features that basically went unused. When this video comes out, it's very close to the holiday season for a lot of people, so I thought it was appropriate to run this demo. I thought I heard somewhere that if I run this with sound, there it is, Sid Christmas music, um, I heard that you get a copyright claim, so I'm not too sure about that. Testing this 128 has been interesting. As I mentioned earlier, this whole video was a little bit of a fiasco. I just don't have a lot of experience testing 128s because I have to admit, I've worked on more than like probably five or six flat machines and they just generally always work. I think the worst I ever had was like a little bit of RAM problems on one of them or the VIC-2 chip was failing, but otherwise they always just seemed to work properly. So because of that, I never really got my diagnostic setup working. And like I said, I've never tested the diagnostic test harness on the 128. So I didn't even realize that that little keyboard adapter doesn't work on the 128 DCR. At least for the future, I should hopefully remember that. And it's nice that I have that VersaCart finally configured with a proper 128 diagnostic ROM. So if I do have a C128 with RAM problems, then maybe that diagnostic ROM will tell me which chip is bad. Or if there's any other issues, like with some of the ports, then I should be able to figure that out as well. Anyhow, I think that's really going to be it. Huge thanks to my patrons. Their names are scrolling the side of the screen. They make it all possible that I do this full time. So huge thanks to them. You can, remember, there, <laughs> you can become a patron at the link in the description below. Thumbs up, subscribe, all the usual YouTube junk. And I think that is going to be that. So stay healthy, stay safe, and I will see you next time. Bye. I just noticed this demo here says Executive 64. 96 colors? Apple compatible? What's it talking about here? What 96 colors? What? Weird.